Hey guys, welcome back. So now getting into X-Force, which has literally gone non-stop since like the first issue. And like in my mind, I could just imagine like Benjamin Percy and Jonathan Hickman sitting down having a conversation and Percy just being like, oh, oh, the X-Men can do what? Okay, so you mean I can do, oh man, we about to have fun with this. Because it's not just where he takes the story, but it's also like him throwing in things that we'd seen with Jonathan Hickman within Powers of 10 and House of X. So let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. Alright, so jumping right in because there's a lot we gotta talk about. Because first, starting this off in a place to where Krakoa is a new nation, and just recently they had went through their legal-ish means of becoming a nation with the assistance of Emma Frost like we had seen in House of X, but along with becoming this safe haven for mutants to come to from around the world, Charles already knew that there's gonna have to be some sketchy sort of things that he needed to do, which initially started with Emma Frost swaying some of the votes, and prior to the point of us getting to X-Force, the Marauders were like your most recent example, with them smuggling goods on and off the island, but in addition to that, also helping other mutants who had trouble making their ways to the different Krakoan gates around the world, which would then cause the Marauders to step in to guarantee their safe travel. But just adjacent to the Marauders, you have the Hellfire Club, who are essentially the means which Charles' savior has used, with them already being plugged all over the world, Charles needed these connections so that even though certain countries refused to take specific imports from Krakoa, but by way of the Hellfire Club's previous resources, in addition to the strong hand of the Marauders, this was like the beginning of Charles making moves to secure Krakoa by any means, which also started Charles creating a number of companies like Xavier Pharmaceuticals, Blackbird Motors, <laughs> Wolverine Waste Management, <laughs> just to name a few, and we should probably like just have a whole video talking about like Charles Xavier's portfolio. Because once Krakoa was legally a nation, these businesses started rolling out back to back to back, and mainly to strengthen the wealth of that nation to better protect the mutants who were there, but also gradually make it in one of the most powerful countries in the world, because money talks. But in addition to this, early on when Krakoa had first become a nation, and also during the early stages of a number of these startups, Charles also sent Domino to do a secret investigation on a number of shell companies who had ties to either anti-mutant politicians or anti-mutant businesses, which is a mission that definitely goes into the under the table dealings that Charles Xavier is doing. But in this case, it's one of the most critical, because when it comes to intel for the island of Krakoa and for mutant kind, this literally could mean life or death, because even with all the information that they've received from Warren McTaggart, those were from past lifetimes, and though all that information is very critical, and certain echoes from those lifetimes do come back, but it's not like a roadmap to tell them what's gonna happen in this lifetime. So it's for that very reason that gathering intel is critical. And so now in the case of Domino, who had been following these leads, one of them eventually led her to like a 35 year old Irishman who worked at an investment firm and he hosted a number of anti-mutant dark web chat rooms by night to which Domino caught wind of, got into the dude's emails, to where she found flight itinerary to Seoul, South Korea, which led her to what she believed to be one of these meetings, but when she arrived she was made almost immediately. And the way that she got caught up, it was like initially it had seemed like this was a secret meetup for just humans and presumably another one of those dark web uploads to where the title of their next video was going to be like mutant sovereignty and what we're going to do about it. But when the meeting started to make sure nobody there was a mutant, they started pricking their fingers, testing for blood, seemingly just to make sure that everyone there was human. But as it turned out, they knew that Domino had been tracking them for some time and they had essentially left breadcrumbs with the flight itineraries and the emails about the meetups because they knew that these clues would lead her directly to them. And prior to this point, Domino would report back to Krakoa promptly at 2400 hours every day. But with these meetings that would take place at night, it actually took place at about the same time that she would report back, which left Krakoa roughly 24 hours behind her current location, or really any of her most recent updates. But so when we jump back to Krakoa and we catch up with Beast, who was minding his business studying the island just before getting mauled by a, a grizzly billy goat bear and like really i don't know what to call that thing but ugly but lucky for hank he's saved by logan who quickly just gets this thing off of him and chases it away but for beast this was a quick lesson and a bit of foreshadowing because for beast he didn't feel like he needed to be looking over his shoulder and prior to this point logan was aware of this thing like lurking around and being a creeper but with this happening it was a quick lesson for hank to remember like no matter where you are even if it's this safe haven known as Krakoa, that even still, no matter what, that there are always predators. 
And so at this point in time, as far as like your security for Krakoa, which has this external nervous system, which extends both aquatic and in the atmosphere to where at the helm of it, you have Black Tom Cassidy, who we've known prior to this point more so as a villain of the X-Men, the cousin of Banshee, cellmate of Juggernaut, and the dude that controls plants. But essentially, he's pretty perfect for this role because rather than just saying Krakoa is going to take care of everything, we instead have Black Tom who connects through Krakoa and connects with the plankton in the water for like 25 square miles so he'll know who or what's approaching in the water or even he'll connect with the pollen or the spores to monitor above Krakoa once again up to 25 square miles and use this connection which Krakoa allows as an extension of his nervous system and act literally as a living breathing security alarm. But also around this time, we see that he's detected the Marauders heading up the shore to where this time they bring in Colossus who's been hurt pretty bad and mainly from coming into resistance from helping other mutants from different countries around the globe to whom most of which are fully against everything that Krakoa is doing. Much like we'd seen when we had talked about Marauders when we seen them run into some of that resistance. But not long after when Charles is preparing to go to Sokovia and really it's a trip for him to get a treaty signed just in and out for him to head back. But while he's on his way, he gets a word from Sage who gives him the update that she still hasn't heard from Domino since she's gone dark but she also lets Charles know that she'll keep looking and if she does find anything she'll let him know as soon as possible but when Charles arrives here in Sokovia we switch to this group of well-built men and women who are boarding a flight from Seoul South Korea directly to Honolulu Hawaii and as they're boarding the plane it's like you can tell like they're up to something because they're looking at different people like the dude who's loading luggage on the plane to the dude who's signaling the plane like there's a lot of weird eye contact like it's super sketchy but as far as charles who's here in sokovia to where like i mentioned just in and out getting this treaty signed and after that heading right back to krakoa but while he's there shaking hands and getting this picture taken and really just more or less doing the whole song and dance that just goes with political stuff but while he's there, one of the servers slip a tracker in his drink so that when he ingests it, he'll take it back with him to Krakoa. And now I'm not saying that's part of the song and dance. And with that part, I was just talking about the pictures and everything, not slipping nano trackers in the drink. <laughs> but as it turns out, the sketchy well-built travelers who were heading to Honolulu, they had really just used the flight as a cover up with its route passing over Krakoa so that they would drop down on the island around the same time that Charles Xavier got back. And when they fall through like they are coming in hot like i don't know how high that plane was but it had them dropping through like a cluster of shooting stars but with doing this for reasons that we'll get to later they actually appeared as domino returning to the island of Krakoa, which is what allowed them to enter to Krakoa from the skies without setting off an alert but even with Krakoa and sage picking them up as domino black tom knew that something wasn't right and even though he goes to tell charles xavier charles just lets him know more or less that you got to trust the rest of this team the same way that i'm telling them to trust you which makes sense with Black Tom's background, but even still, like his mutant power connects him to Krakoa like an extension of his nervous system, which theoretically could make him a bit more sensitive than Krakoa. And if you ask me, like if he feels like something ain't right, then that's a viable argument. But the messed up part is how right he was. Because when these mercenaries touched down, as soon as they hit the ground, like it was a slaughter. And although they already have in mind who their primary target is, they were still adamant on killing as many mutants as they could along the way. Like it was really messed up. And it's like you can tell like from their attack that this thing was planned out. But granted, like even with that and them having the element of surprise, like once that was gone, the mutants started taking them out fairly quickly. Like with Black Tom, who for him, the whole island is a weapon and once Wolverine made his way back from the outskirts which was pretty quick and I remember having like a trading card back in the day that said Wolverine could run somewhere between 25 to 30 miles an hour which as a kid I was like ooh cool but now like looking back it's like how you do that with two legs and you're not a speedster and plus back then Wolverine was like 5'3 in the comics so picture that but when Wolverine gets back we see a bit of that concept return when he had mentioned the beast that there are always predators and pretty much everything that Wolverine has said it applies to everybody on the island being comfortable and feeling safe which is something that gene even mentions at this point that they've all made that mistake collectively but at this point with them pretty much stopping all of the mercenaries except for one who they need to catch quickly because at this point charles hasn't made it back to cover yet but essentially that last mercenary he knows exactly where to find charles and when he does logan gene and hank are not able to get there on time and as they approach all they hear is that one shot and like when i first seen this man like it was almost like a movie like when everything goes silent but it's like the action is still 
still going but everything's like in slow motion because after that single shot logan took like three to the chest and he immediately started playing operator with the dude's intestines and i don't mean operator like doctor doctor i mean operator like unplug this here and put that there type of situation like logan was connecting a collect call from his gallbladder to his lymph nodes or something but when this happened like it, it just felt just like a movie like where everything goes quiet and it's like you already know like the worst has already happened and even now in this moment you have sage like she's trying to reach out to hank she's trying to reach out to gene to black tom and to logan because she's looking at the senses while this is happening but even from where she's at looking at the fact of what happened she still can't believe that charles xavier is dead and even with logan gene and hank seeing this with their own eyes they find it hard to believe themselves and so now okay check this out so now like with the new system of rebirthing mutants and the way that it's set up with the five who would physically bring the mutant back and after that charles xavier would upload their minds back into their body at this point in time they have done this countless times over and over again but from where they stand this is the first time that they've run into this with charles to whom from what we know from like house of x when he requested for forge to think of a way to not only make it possible for cerebral to back up mutants as far as their consciousness while scanning their minds but also for forge to figure out a way for them to do this with multiple backups which is exactly what has come back to at this point with charles and needed that backup for himself and eventually for everyone else with him assassinated and cerebro destroyed so it's like because of what we've seen in house of x we know that there are other copies of cerebro located somewhere that could fix this but even still like for the mutants bringing charles back this is the first time and rightfully so there's a lot of skepticism like what if this doesn't work like like, what will we do then and i like that we see that because it's essentially like we see them doubt in this time of despair but even when this happens we see magneto hold true to a promise which he had made to charles back in house of x because if you guys remember back when charles and mora went to visit magneto and pretty much tell him what needed to be done after magneto had seen the previous timelines and he agreed to work with charles he also told him that they will scope this new path together and if charles would falter that magneto wouldn't but even with doing so he understood that charles was gonna have to take on a different path from what he had dreamed and it's here like in a sign of faith and encouragement when gene starts to show a bit of doubt about them bringing charles back for the first time and it's here where magneto reshaped cerebro and made it into a sword to symbolize the continuation of charles xavier's path and as different as the sword was from cerebro so will the vision of charles xavier moving forward like a monument that once represented the rebirth of the people of which it still does with many of their memories still in it but now it's all also been reformed as a sword that is ready to fight and protect and i gotta tell you man like this whole idea of the cerebro sword it completely blows my mind because it's so poetic and so appropriate for x-force but from here gene and hank of course go to cradle one which is one of the locations around kokoa to where they have nearby spare cerebros to where at this time it's a very tricky process not just getting it started up but essentially doing the rebirthing process without charles present because once again he's done this every time but while Hank and Gene are taking care of that, we jump over to the healing gardens to where this autopsy for these mysterious mercenaries is underway. And while they're cutting these dudes open, they come to find out like each one of them was like built for war. Like they had extra bones in their forearms to pull as weapons, which kind of sound like somebody else in the room. But they also had their teeth like cored with putty explosives. Their ears were like spooled with wire for either choking people or climbing. Like everything on their body was a weapon. But essentially when Logan gets here, and he discovers that one of them is still alive. He also overhears them talk about the skin grab from Domino's skin, which they used to fool Krakoa's defenses, and he tells them to get Jean in there as soon as possible, to get as much information as she can out of that last mercenary's mind, so they can use that to find Domino. And it's pretty funny to see like Wolverine go on his hunt, because he started his investigation by going back to the airport and pretty much backtracking the plane that had passed over Krakoa, which was pretty smart by the way. But when he goes, like, he can't get past like the security software and he's typing on the computer like one finger at a time and when he's just like hitting buttons he goes to the camera looking right towards him and he sees the guard walking in behind him like it's pretty hilarious and like this guard is anything but trouble for wolverine and so it's like he's not necessarily worried about him but like when he turns around to shut him up real quick he's essentially stopped by kid omega who essentially is a huge help coming along here in helping out logan because aside from telepathy and telekinesis he can also process information like 
like super fast, which immediately comes in handy when he takes the password from the security guard's mind and he immediately knows how to use the security software to find exactly what they need to backtrack the flight of the mercenaries and find the tag of the vehicle that they arrived at the airport in which was pretty clutch because it essentially led them back to the location of a printing press but as ironic as it was a printing press like when they got there this place was straight up just printing out killers and almost like Build-A-Bear but instead you walk in and you point at a picture of John Wick but while they were there back in Krakoa Jean had stepped away from bringing back Charles so that she could quickly scan the mind of the surviving mercenary and mainly because Wolverine did such a number on him there's no telling how long he'll hold out but with going into his mind which Jean described as dark but even with that that all she saw with this mask who someone was hiding behind with remnants of a peacock and with seeing this she really just didn't know what to make of it at least not yet but back in South Korea with Wolverine and Kid Omega who are still snooping through the build your own killer factory but while they're there Kid Omega gets grabbed by a dude that looked like inside out boy from like Nickelodeon at least I think that was Nickelodeon man that's a throwback I don't know if y'all gonna catch that but also when this happens it's like the red alert that Kid Omega's powers are not working but fortunate enough for Wolverine like everything he does is pretty much analog so like you can't make like adamantium not be adamantium unless you're like Magneto and then that's a whole nother problem but with Kid Omega losing his powers and telling Wolverine like look I'm not like you I'm not a killing machine and Wolverine who pretty much knows like you know he's the best there is at what he does and what he does isn't good but at this point in time with all these half-baked psychos running around the place he just lets Kid Omega know like bro you better learn quick and he does pretty well he protects himself in the little head and spine to try to grab him real quick but at the same time it was kind of like a red flag because all of these dudes coming after them as well as something dampening their powers like this can only add up to them hiding something which of course was correct because here at this factory they were hiding Domino to whom they was grafting her skin to a number of these different mercenaries and I'm not gonna front man like it broke my heart a little bit just to see Domino there like that and it's like even though we have like the whole concept of being able to to bring people back or even just give them new bodies it's like even still you got to keep in mind like the psychological damage that stays with them when they remember all of this and I know like even like all the way back towards like House of X I would see like in the comments like a lot of you guys were kind of concerned about the whole thing of bringing people back and more or less kind of wondering like where does where's the gravity or the threat if you can do that but even on the flip side of that I make the argument that the scars that are in their mind that they definitely weigh much heavier than their physical bodies which will be destroyed and they'll just get a new one like some of these experiences might low-key change some of these people forever but essentially with Wolverine and Kid Omega like when they get Domino out of her containment and they're immediately chased down by the hulking big nasty it's here where Domino finally gets enough strength to tell them that the device around her neck that is actually a power inhibitor and that they'll need to destroy it in order to get their powers back and as soon as Wolverine destroys it like Kid Omega he's able to whip up his signature sonic rocket launcher and it's a wrap but not long after this going back to Krakoa when we get back to that last mercenary that has survived who they've hardly been keeping alive with the healer just to get more information out of them because they really just need all the intel they can use so they can figure out who's behind this and why but when they leave him alone in the healing gardens a shadow figure steps in suffocates the dude and he's gone just like that and with how it happened it wasn't really anything that anyone looked into after mainly because how bad his condition was and they were more or less expecting to lose him anytime soon but around this time we go back to Gene who's returned to Hank to assist him in bringing back Charles Xavier and it's pretty crazy because Gene and Hank are having this conversation which initially started with I want to say Hank asking Gene if she believes like they'll ever miss death and throughout the conversation she mentions that she's died a number of times which immediately made me think of something I'd seen a while back like when Chris Claremont killed off Gene with the Phoenix Saga and Jim Shooter who's like editor-in-chief at the time he pretty much promised Chris Claremont that he wouldn't allow Gene to be resurrected which as we know that definitely happened and now like in the hands of Hickman like everybody's coming back and like just that thought has me curious to like like what would Chris Claremont like what would he say like what would he think about this and I mean like really like of his thoughts of like Dawn of X like all together like I'm, I'm curious to know but essentially with Gene and Hank we do see that they're successful at bringing back Charles Xavier but also when they do this it's like close to the time when Magneto he's supposed to speak to the public and like just before he does Black Tom is in his ear like if you don't make an example out of these people I will and really for Black Tom a lot of that is coming out of the hurt that he feels because this essentially happened on his watch but as soon as Magneto steps through to address the press and possibly even tell them that Charles is dead because at this 
point, I don't even think he got the update just yet. But before he can even utter a word, Charles steps through right behind him, and Charles assures the world that he's alive and kicking, which at this point is a double entendre. But even still with them seeing him alive, there's plenty of speculation and people wondering if this was actually him. And quite similarly to his words to Black Tom just before he was killed, like his last words, he told the media that just like before in the beginning, like they're gonna have to just trust him and just take his word that this is him, much like they did before any of all this. But in addition to this, and just as like an extra bit before we wrap up, like not long after this press meeting, Magneto actually gave the Cerebro Sword as a gift to Charles. And with doing so, he told Charles to keep it close to him. And even with doing so, Charles took the sword and he sat it above his bed, like on the wall above his bed in his living quarters. And even after that, Charles would say at times that he could hear the data still moving through the sword at night when he goes to sleep. But even with doing so, like he has never slept better, which is pretty crazy because I really feel like this sword is going to be pretty significant later on. And definitely let me know what you guys think down in the comments. But real quick before I go, I want to give a quick shout out to all the Patreons, of which we got a couple new members to the squad. So shout out to Mike W and also shout out to Chase C. Just want to thank you guys for heading over there and supporting the spills, man. Once again, all of you guys are very much appreciated. But yeah, man, just FYI, we are definitely hopping back to X-Force very soon. Because like you can tell that Percy is making a lot of things within this narrative like meaningful. And it's almost like he's having a lot of fun with the parameters of what's going on within Dawn of X at the same time. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And also, like, let me know some of your theories on the Cerebro Sword. Because I can't help but think that that's going to come back in some way, form, or fashion later on down the line. Especially with it still having backups of mutants still in the sword. But let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And we'll do it again in the next one. Alright, later.